When Steel Talks, everybody listens. This is an exclusive for Basement Recordings. The program is called When Steel Talks, and we are very, very pleased to welcome Mr. Robert Grant, your ranger and seconds player extraordinaire. Yeah. <laughs> very nice to have you, Mr. Grant. Very nice to be here. And When Steel Talks is very much interested as um, are our um, people on the website to get a bit more into arrangers in general and of course at this moment we have you with us. We're going to be asking a few questions um, based on your arranging experiences and also we're going to focus a bit on you as a solo performer and your professional experiences worldwide. Once okay. again, welcome. Thank you. Um, good um, to be here. Let's start with how did you get started in Pan? I got started in Japan uh, through uh, my family, uh, my uncle, a gentleman by the name of Carl Greenwich, deceased now. And um, I was born in Labrador, and uh, he had a band, they had a group uh, called the Savoy's Steel Band uh, in Lower Labrador. And that's where I recently just across the street from the band. So. I used to hear the music, I used to watch my uncle and then tune the pans and make all these different things and the songs and I was uh, probably around the age of six, seven before I walked in the pan yard and uh, tried to stand on a box to play the bass type thing um, and the other pans too because it was still too tall for me and um, the guys was interested in showing me and my uncle and um, the other folks around the band. I take the um, initiative to really, um, really try and learn as much as I could. I mean, I was young at the time, uh, six, seven years old. I didn't know exactly what it was until maybe, you know, at the age of 10, I realized what I was doing. And um, I tried to learn as much as I could within that, uh, that group. Um, we had people uh, like uh, uh, Martin Albino and Lola Albino um, used to coach us, uh, teach us a lot of the, uh, musical stuff on, on the blackboard, actually, the chords and the different things that we learned. That's what we learned uh, really to, uh, to play. And um, I've been with them, I went with Star Voice for uh, a long period of time, uh, just learning and getting more experiences of what it was, parenting. And um, I think um, after that, I went to another group called the City Kids, which is family band too, from Belmont. It's a very small band, but uh, they were. A lot of people came out of that band that um, did well also. And that was on my father's side. So I had music on my mother's side, and my uncle and them, and uh, had music on my father's side. So there was the two bands I was uh, learning a lot of stuff with, and then eventually I put the graduation thing by going to Desperados in 1965. Um, I was playing around, and uh, I so then Rudolph Charles found us and uh, we had some great pans and great sounding pans from a new guy called Bass Van. And uh, when they heard the pans, uh, he asked us uh, if we could come join Desperados and if we could bring the pans with us. And we mm -hmm. did. And that was in 1965. And um, from there, uh, I stayed with Desperados until uh, at least 1998. So it was a long period of time in there I was doing. After being with Desperados, uh, we started to, um, they started to give me opportunities to learn to arrange. We started learning a lot of stuff from like Clive Bradley, uh, Beverly Griffith. Uh, those are the arrangers um, at the time with Desperados. And you I looked was upon them as maybe your mentors at the time? Yes, yes we did because um, we were always interested in arrangement, how to do it. We could have done a little bit but it wasn't all that great like the, those professional guys. And, um, as the time go along, they give us opportunities to arrange stuff for the bands, yeah. songs, I should say. Um, but this was, and uh, I started to do, you know, little pop songs for them, little, you know, easy songs until I got used to. More experience. Yeah, a little more experience. And then they would, uh, we would ask them, you know, how is this and everything, and they, would, you know, advise us on what to do and how not to do, you know, how to get this correct chord or the voices. Mostly voicing was the main thing that we were interested in. What exactly is voicing? Voicing is like um, knowing how to voice the instrument, knowing the ranges of the instruments, 
um, as an arranger standpoint and you have music with um, if you have a telepan with a low C and you have a part where it has a low B and a low A under that um, you get a, it's a little dif difficult because of the fact that it's not the note is not in the drum so you have to translate another instrument which is lower that have that note and um, you may want to make a chord of like C major uh, when you want to make that C major chord the voicing is important in that you may have the basses play C you might have the four pounds play C and E you might have the seconds play E and G you might have they would spread it out to the nines, they would have the tennis split like G and D, so it just spread out, it's a whole voice. That's and what one call chord. It, or one chord. That's good. So you would regard um, Savoy, City Kids, and Desperados basically as your training ground? Yeah. And we would say like your musical influences and experiences, and we would look at like Clyde Bradley, yes. and Beverly Griffith. Very correct. Um, and Martin Albino, another guy. Mark Nardino. Yeah, he was the first one uh, that started to teach us in Southways, so I can't forget him. Martin Albino, yes. okay. So and also my uncle, Carl Greenwich. Carl Greenwich, yeah. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, what you've done is encapsulated one of the questions which I would have later asked, but okay. you've just taken care of that, as yeah. to who your musical influences were, mm -hmm. and who your mentors were. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly what it was. And um, also, there's another guy that I looked up to as a player. Um, he's a tuner these days. He used to play with the Invaders uh, many years ago, and he's one of the most famous uh, soloists also. It's, um, it's Ivan Riley, which is called Koboja. This is his nickname up here. And um, he tuned, as a matter of fact, he tuned the background pass and moved this year. He was uh, one of the guys that um, we used to. Uh, uh, listen to a lot because we like his style of sewing as a soloist, not as a full band and sound, but as a soloist. Does he still play, by chance? Well, he plays. Um, when is the last time you personally heard him play? Well, I heard him play bass not too long ago um, at Washington Carnival. Mm -hmm. But um, he's, uh, he's one of the world's, uh, he's still, I think, uh, considered one of the world's best players. He's just uh, one of those quiet guys. That, take up the tuning and he took a whole other occupation by like being a fireman earlier on and now he settled back into himself, now he's tuning a lot and um, he's still playing. But I haven't heard him play like the double seconds or the tennis which I know is, is very good. Um, yeah and um, he's I guess these days he's more sticking to the tuning of the drum and um, trying to get a better tonal quality as he goes along. But he's been tuning for a long time too together with uh, Eddie Manet. So because he came out of the invaders and um, our connection was, be we had a connection between invaders and desperados and the connection was because uh, we used to have the same kind of range of pans like invaders, mm -hmm. Despers had and um, Ellie and Jack used to come up to uh, Despers, we both used to go down to uh, invaders and they used to you know, incorporate things together and put people together like the tuners, he wanted to get that sound they had down mm -hmm. there. He also wanted to, um, which is Rudolph, he also wanted to get the best tuners they have around, uh, the best arrangers and make his band what they are today. And um, through having people like Jack and all these uh, people came up the hill to play with us, mm -hmm. we had um, good experiences by learning a lot of stuff from them. And they take the band to another height again. Would you be working with Despers, you think, again? Uh, maybe sometime in the end. I mean, uh, all I did was really take a break from working with them because uh, I not got blown to a After so many years, I just decided to take a break from them. And um, I, um, they have, uh, Clyde Bradley is really back with the band, which is great. Okay. And he, um, before, as I said, they were the arrangers of the band in the earlier days. And then they take a break and we stepped in as arrangers. We? <laughs> we meaning? Well, we meaning we had a group of us in Despers that wanted uh, that were learning to arrange at the time. Like myself, um, Denzel Botas from Despers, mm -hmm. um, uh, Nolly Nicholas is past. Uh, there's a couple other players uh, all around. Um, that came through our hands uh, up here in New York uh, from the Desperate Steel Band also. Some of them have their own bands now. Um, I just can't call everybody's name, but I know that uh, a lot of them are forming their own thing and they learn a lot, uh, even from Clyde, even from Beverly, because we were all in, in the band together. And uh, as I said, the we were talking about was like myself and Denzel, uh, Fulham and Melo 
Manitoba and uh, Nolly Nicholas, we call them Panther, he passed. Um, and a couple others in the band that started to arrange also. So most of the stuff that we learned, as I said, was right there at the Laventon Community Centre. That's where we learned to really uh, do most of the arrangements. And they gave us the opportunity to do it. We would just listen to the records and try to take the music of the record player. Uh, because most of us at the time couldn't read too well. And still can't. <laughs> But um, it's, it's good, reading is good when you want to learn something. Because if you have it and you memorize it after that, you should be okay. You need people just to read and find you in your class, you know. You arranged for solo nights? Solo pan nights. Solo pan nights? Yes. Sir? That came about through, um, well, the, the pan yard of solo pan nights was between my house and this was. Yeah, so when I go to Despers, I would come back up step by solo. So it was a young band came out from the solo harmonites band. Okay, I was they had a split. Okay. They had a split, and the sponsor went with Pan Knights. They didn't stay with the harmonites. So the harmonites now has I think they are being sponsored by White Oak, okay. Fernandez or one of those. But the so uh, the sponsor went with Pan Knights, and then uh, this is Owen Serrett and his band, and they wanted to. Uh, they, you know, they had a, they formed this band. They wanted an arranger to do some music for them, and they asked me if I can do it. And I did say yes because um, in those days you could have arranged for two, three, four bands if you wanted. Now it's different. There are a lot you only one band to arrange for. In Trinidad. Yes. Okay. Which is a little ticklish because you can't tell a doctor how many patients to operate on. Mm. You know, um, or you can't tell a captain how many houses to build. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Due to that, um, we got um, Clyde Bradley back at Desperados and I s went ahead and stayed with Solo Pan Nights as the arranger for the last five years or how long they are there. Mm -hmm. What are the differences, if any, that you found with arranging for Desperados in contrast with Solo Pan Nights? Uh, the difference is the players a lot um, because Desperados has a lot of fine players. Um, the, well, the things we learned from learning all the classical things before, with uh, uh, we had people like Pat Bishop teaching us, the name Raymond Shaw, we had Anthony Prospect, we had all these teachers, all these classical pieces for the stage band. So by learning all that, this was a band that stuck together, and the players stay with each other, and after a while, everybody got to know um, all what to do. And um, in, from an arranger standpoint, being between them, I know what I could have given them to play and what they could take and what they cannot take. And then when you get to solo panyard, the difference is that there they were more kids in that band also. There were not too many experienced players. Um, most of the experienced players, I think, stayed with harmonies. Uh, and then they got about five or six that came across the panyard, plus the youths. And as I say, well, on my way from the first panyard, I used to stop at solo yard on my way home on my way back to Desperate still mm -hmm. because I mean uh, I used to do when we do the panorama tunes with them or any tune I would go up in the day do the music go home meet and come back do the music at night so I, what I did is that I kind of split that also by going to Desperate in the day come a solo in the afternoon go home and eat come back to solo and then back to Desperate mm -hmm. so I had a kind of rough one portfolio yeah. you know so um, the thing about the kids in uh, Pine Ice they learned fast but they were not the that's the experienced yeah. Despers uh, players, because um, I get used to the players in Despers. I would know how to, how and who, what to give, what kind of runs, or what Basically to do. Basically, you know them intimately. Yeah, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. After all these years, you yeah. know. Been we travel all over, we've been to Africa, we've been to London, we've been to anywhere with Des that Despers travel, we were there. And, you know, sick as a family, you know. But back to Pan Nights, they, um, they started off the. Um, I was the only arranger so far as arranged with that band because they were brand new. I think it's either 92 or 94 they came out somewhere in between there. And ever since I've been arranging for them, as I said, that's when we could have done two or three bands. Now they are limited to one band. So, um, as I said, Clive is back on the hill. So, while he's on the hill, I would still like to do my Panama music. So I went ahead and stick with solo for that. It's good that you mentioned um the, the the restriction there because that is a good lead into my next question which would have been what do you find what are the comparisons with 
you find as an arranger, I should say, between the Trinidad panorama and the New York panorama. And obviously, one difference off the bat would be the fact that currently there is not a restriction for how many bands you can arrange for in New York. But of course, um, in Trinidad now you're saying that restriction is in place, one band. Yeah. So what are, along with that, what are your likes, your dislikes, what are your observations, um, the advantages, mm -hmm. as opposed to being a New York arranger and a Trinidad arranger? Well, so far with the New York arrangement, um, I have seen, uh, uh, for example, this year here, um, two, two, um, Clyde Bradley has done two bands. Nobody said anything so far. Um, I haven't seen any other arranger here yet did two bands for the season in New York. So I know you have that space you could still play around here because it's not as um, stringent. Yeah, you know. So if um, and Trinidad is real tough. Um, there's a lot of bands and there's a lot of bands that need help too. Um, there's a lot of bands that have young arrangers that need. It's so good to have guidance. professional arrangers guide them, like how we were. Guided by Beverly Griffiths and by Clyde Beverly and Clyde. You know, that's how we learned. And that's how we went ahead and being able to, we are able to arrange our own thing now without mm -hmm. them, without their help. And um, I think that that alone is a, is a plus by itself, being able to you know, come out and do your own thing. You know. um, hope, I, I hope they don't try to limit it here yet. <laughs> because as I said, there's a lot of bands that need um, professional arrangers to guide them around. With even though they have their arrangers, I always like to advise them to have someone in the yard who is capable of doing a song or something for the band. It don't have to be a panorama tune, but at least they could do some songs for the band, and then at make the attempts at the panorama uh, material because it's a, it's a ten minute piece that you have to take a three minute song, and you know what you have to mm -hmm. do with that. Put seven minutes of music onto that, and sometimes it's not too easy. As much as some, you know, we've been doing it for years, so we kind of learn the ins and outs. Yeah, the ins and outs and the ways to do it. And after a while, you get your, you know, you got you got your roadmap down, and then you know, you take it from there and do all the, the embellishments on it. And, yeah. Do you consider, as an arranger, after so many years, that you're still growing, and if so, in what direction? Yeah, I think I'm still growing uh, musically. Yes. Um, um, I have uh, learned a lot of different things, um, even still as I go along here, um, during the arrangements I would learn a different voice and maybe sometimes, sometimes I learn to put, um, um, well we have uh, like what we say, like newer instruments within the band now, like the four pans and the, mm -hmm. the quadraphonics, which we didn't have in the earlier days. And um, through that you learn how to voice that, I like, put in that pan in between to, to make your band sound totally different. Like, Usually it would take the place of the, um, it wouldn't take the place, but it would um, assist the melodic pans playing melody by um, having a lower register melody mm -hmm. being played on the pan. And that, that is a voice by itself that is really mm -hmm. makes a big difference. You know? mm. What do you think of the choice of music that's available for pan arrangements and uh, um, tending more to the calypso or the soccer pieces uh, based on what? comes out for from the carnival season in Trinidad. I mean, how do you see that the choices are, you know, out there, or do you find that the pickings could be lean at times? Sometimes it could be, but the choices are out there. Um, what also is happening is that a lot of uh, the arrangers, some of them are doing their own material also, which helps a lot. That um, you did a piece uh, called Sweet Ramona, right? Yes, I did a piece called Sweet by Ramona, Ramona this year, and I also did a piece called The Bomb. So I had two songs out there this year uh, in the panorama, and both were played. One was played by Renegades, one was played by Pan And we had um, Sweet Ramona played up here this year by Caribbean Youth Panoramics. Right, so that guy, Caribbean Youth Panoramics, he was uh, a member of Desperados also. Yeah, Mr. Franklin, uh, all, Joseph Franklin. Joseph Franklin Gerald. We all played in the band. We all came in Desperados around the same time. Now he's an arranger. So it's the I same see. people that we all hooked mm -hmm. up with, that learned from. Uh, I'm pretty sure he would say the same thing about Beverly Clive. or Clive. Mm -hmm. Because those are the people that we learned a lot of stuff from. Mm -hmm. you see? So it's good to know that they're, they're all around. You know, even Denzel Waters with Despers. I mean, he'd been around for so long. And, 
he's one. Um, you know, we all came in together at the same time. And we all wanted to arrange and some like uh, you know do something different. You know, so here we are. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, just before we went on camera, you mentioned that there was a lot more you would like to do with your present arrangement for moves, time mm -hmm. groove, yes. um, you know, who you've arranged for uh, for the 2002 New York Panorama. Right. Uh, were your goals, at least your short-term uh, musical goals, met by moods? Mm -hmm. Were you pleased with the interpretation of what you gave them in the time that you had allocated? Yes, I'm pleased. That's, that's as, you know, um, I was very pleased with him, and I think he did a very good performance. I was not there at the performance because I, I present, uh, I already had a commitment. Um, but I heard that the performance was very good. Um, but I left on the Friday night, and the arrangement was. I think everybody had everything in place, and um, what what they had, I think, is a matter of them performing it, and making it sound like something, and. Um, as I, as I was talking to you before we went on air, is that um, I really wanted to, as I hear it, I want to do more to it, is really what it is. Um, as I have a thing about me that um, we usually have 10 minutes of music to play for a panorama, but usually time time we finish the song, it's always like 14, 15 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, it just depends, to get a whole rounded sound. Because um, I really don't like the limit at the 10 minutes. I mean, they should have something to say between 10 and 11 minutes, something like that. But don't just limit it to 10 minutes because um, sometimes the way the song goes around, right, with the whole arrangement, when you reach to, uh, 9 minutes or 45 seconds, you know, in the middle of a phrase. That's interesting because there seems to be um, a consensus, and probably from people with well tuned ears, they found that while the arrangers like you, who might be able to manage that and do you know, a very credible job on it. There are some arrangers who may have difficulty in getting past four and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that would yeah, be... Yeah, but we got so used to it, being in Trinidad with the steel band um, uh, panorama every yeah, year, mm -hmm. it's 10 minutes. And I always have a query with that at home also. But when I, even when I do Despers or even when I did uh, Pan Nights, I, because most of the times, you know, I sound would either be nine and a half minutes or, mm -hmm. or <laughs> ten and a half. You know, it, it's kind of hard, or ten point five, whatever. But you know, it's very hard to stop on the ten minute mark. So, what's the restriction? The official restriction at the time that's in Trinidad. Is there an official restriction here that you know? Of? This I don't know, but I believe it is ten minutes too. Okay. And um, some guys, as you say, would come with six minutes of music and leave it there all the time until I know some guys that does that. I know a lot of guys. Um, <laughs> And then um, there's other guys that would, you know, they would do that and the night before they would say, okay, we'll put on some more music, but then by that time, um, everybody got to learn it. You got to give, you got to give the time for the players to really consume the music and really be able to put it back up. Mm -hmm. See, and um, I used to do things also, we little songs like, and finish the song like the night before the show. And um, sometimes it's a little difficult. For the players themselves, if they, um, they need that spend confidence. That time. Yeah. When they, yeah, they need it. They need to be playing by instinct by the time they hit the stage, as opposed right. to looking for the notes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of big bands night. that really um, get the songs done ahead of time. So like Exodus and all these bands. So they always rehearse and when you hear them, they enjoy it. They don't have to think about am I going to do this note and miss this now? But they already rehearse and have everything done. Back. That's a good point. How long before an actual performance would you consider? A good enough point where the bands should know that tune. How many days or how many? I say four days. Four days. Four so they five should, days. Yeah. So they should have. Because if you sessions. have it, like you know, your real, your panorama is on Saturday, and if you finish your music by Monday, you have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to really run the sounds. I mean, just run it without really doing anything and okay. smoothen it out. Because usually, you know, it's not just the music alone, um, but the togetherness. Of everybody just, you know, like like. 20 tenors playing the same thing at the same time. You know, sometimes you always find one person in between there might differ a little bit because he didn't take the time to really get it going like a, like a, a unit, like a, you know, a whole knitted thing where everybody will say, I have it, and you have to worry about me, I'll cover your back, you cover my, we yeah, got to go, you know. That. But um, 
some bands kind of learn this song, like I understand there's a band that finished their song this um, <laughs> on the trap. And I don't understand how they, you know, that's the long time. You mean in the New York Panorama? In the New York Panorama, yeah. from oh. what I heard. I don't know what true it is, but um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, <laughs> things like that, you know, you have a period of time to handle um, these things, and you, you have to always remember your players, because you can have all they the have music in your head. Right. You can have all the music in sing. your head, and you give it to them, and when they reach there, it's like, um, okay, I can do it. But, yeah, you know, they have to interpret, to they have to memorize and sing. Yeah, you know, and um, I think that um, if you give yourself four or five days, you could really have, you know, a good performance. In other words, the arranger really have to finish his music a week before time, which is very rare. But I mean, you know. Do you manage? Sometimes. Did you manage with moves? Moves? No, I didn't manage. I Actually, I did about three days before, yes. Pretty good for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because um, well, I was I didn't have enough time um, to do the music for them because I've been traveling in and out, in and out. Yeah, you had performances at uh, Jones. Uh, you had performances Jones at Jones Beach. Beach. Um, I had performances in Chicago, I had performances in uh, Boston, um, in the period of time that I was doing the music for yeah. them. That's a good lead-in. Tell me about yourself. You're considered one of the world's best second players. What do you consider makes you different from other second players? What makes you outstanding? It may not be your interpretation, but you know, what do you know? of it, that makes you who you are, Robert Grinnis? Uh, well, Robert Grinnis doesn't let this play second band only. Mm -hmm. Robert Grinnis is a overall band player. Um, that's what he learned to play all. Stop playing second band because the second band is what we call a wolf horse. Mm. Um, I don't play any other instruments, and from a, a range of point of view, you need an instrument when you're doing the music. And my second band is my wolf horse. Mm -hmm. So I stuck with it for many and many years. And, um, Every now and then I would go across to the tenor and play and come back to it. But um, those are the two main parts that I play now because um, as, as lead player, as a lead player, you know, we have other people playing the background music on the other instruments. So the difference with me is I, I do a lot of rehearsals. I think everybody else does rehearsals. I um, try to um, improve whatever I do um, every day. So you do practice daily? Oh yeah, I do. Okay, that again? Oh yeah, so I, you practice I practice daily. daily um, a little bit of what they see of me here in New York is not it's just a, a little small section of Robert. Um, uh, I do a lot of uh, classical pieces on my own. I do a lot of I've written a lot of uh, material for the pan also. I have about five or six CDs out there with pan and conventional instruments. They're not um, say fully all calypsos or anything. It's a mixture. It's a light, light jazz. Um, you know, CD 101 type thing, uh, classical, it's just a mix of different things. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that with a, a my, well, I live in LA and I've been living out there for a period of time where I met guys and we formed a group together and go in the studio and record, put things down together and I also do a lot of stuff on my own. Um, do a lot of different workshops all over the place. I travel around. I just came from an early management workshop in West Virginia University. He has a very good program there. Um, uh, there's a lot. That That's I good think. because I wanted to find out, and I'm sure you know the audience we have in the world still talk websites would be pretty interested in what is a typical month or a typical year for Robert Greenwich, the professional, because this is your livelihood. Yeah, but. Well, Carnival time is uh, for the steel band. Because there are some arrangers who, that's the only time they work. Yeah. Right? And you know, the rest of the year it's hard for them. Yeah. They basically don't work, but that's not the case with Robert Greenwich. No, no, Robert Greenwich works 365 days a year. He don't work every day, but his job entails 365 days a year. And um, I have spaced myself out in such a way that I can have my own breaks now and do different things. Um, uh, the pan itself is... That's my livelihood, I, and that's all I do. I've been doing it for a long period of time like that, and I, you know, pretty, uh, I don't want to say lucky, but I have some luck in that too, to be able to go. You're blessed in doing something that you love. I'm doing something that I love very much. And um, then I go out also and play with other conventional instruments, uh, artists, people like a gentleman named Taj Mahal, 
Uh, he's a blues singer. I travel a lot with him all over the different places. He sings, I play. Um, I travel with another guy called Jimmy Buffett. He's mm. on. Uh, he does a. He have a lot of, He has his own following. He has his own crowd. His own thing going. Uh, he does that with him during the year. I also um, do concerts in um, different places. As I said, um, I'm going to do a concert in Antigua um, next month. Um, and I do a lot of corporate shows, different places with my group from LA. Um, I also do a lot of um, individual performances, like um, in concert type things, um, just with me alone, maybe a drum and a bass sometimes. Do you find um, when you're out there on the world stage that there's a good reception for the various genres of music you might play? Do you find people taken aback at any point when you play something else other than what would traditionally be referred to or looked upon as tourist fare? Mm -hmm. When you show them this instrument is a serious instrument, it's just as yes. good as anything else, mm -hmm. and perhaps better and more prolific than it. what kind of reception yeah. you get? I get a very good reception from it because of the fact that they, as you say, you know, before they had it as you know, pan as a tourist thing. Um, oh, it's, you know, it sounds okay, but. Because of the way that um, the instruments are tuned now, um, the tuners are making very good instruments, and they um, uh, they are lined up in tune with the conventional instruments, whereas before some of them was not in tune with the conventional instruments. And the average musician would say, "Well, yeah, we play in a, in A major, but you know the pan is not tuned in A. It's not tuned in A four forty or something, which is the basic concept uh, A." Um, before some people used to have their pants tuned in like B flat, some people used to have their pants tuned in D, it depends on who it is. But within the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years, they have maintained like the A440 um, uh, tuning, which puts it right in tune with the piano. Mm -hmm. So when you play with a, a great musician or something, at least you guys could mesh. You, know, you could mesh because you know, the instrument is not out of tune compared to the piano. So when you show them a classical piece, or rather when you play a classical mm -hmm. piece, or you play a jazz piece, or a pop piece, rhythm and blues, yeah. uh, the reception as opposed to what? Marian mm -hmm. is totally different. And um, they see it as an instrument then, when we start to play these other things, mm -hmm. instead of um, you know the old classical, old classic calypso pieces, that are or Bella Fonte, Yellow Bird. or Yellow Bird, people would say. You know, you know. <laughs> We are, it's a whole total different avenue here, and um, as I say, with the instrument being tuned um, correctly with the other instruments, you get a chance to really play with great musicians, learn things from them also. At any um, time. They in turn learn from you too, because I, on my approach to it, is, um, I don't know if everybody does the same approach to the band, but I, um, I am very serious with what I do. But, um, when I get into it, I. I practice a lot, I go into it, learn all what I have to learn, and when I go on a performance, I can play by myself and do my own thing without a problem. And, you know, it's kind of a good show. I it's looked good. at you while you were um, working with moods. I had, you know, that advantage. You were indeed a different person while you were mm -hmm. um, yeah, giving out the music. Yeah. yeah. Well, it has, to be. it has to when be. When Steel uh, Talks. Everybody listens. You have to be uh, from like, being a, you know, you're trying to teach these people, uh, the group, what's going on. You're trying to make sure the music is being played. Yeah. And if you don't have all the musicians or the experienced musicians, you want sometimes it's kind of hard. But then you have to make your adjustments to suit. So what I did with Moves is I, um, I would try to teach all of them um, the parts, make sure they all have it, and then I would go and play also to show them, you know, they, they approached it. Because uh, when this, sometimes I watch some of the guys and they see my approach to it and say, oh, that's what we have to do, okay, well, let's do it this way. I will cross my hand this way, I will, that type thing. But method. It comes, yes. Skill. Method of playing, yeah. Um, you spoke about teaching the guys. There are some people in the pan world out there, the school of thought in their minds is if pan players don't learn to read and write music like professional mm -hmm. quote-unquote musicians, they had a great disadvantage. Not only that, some of them go as far as to say, if these people don't actually um, learn this way, then they're not serious musicians. What is your take on that? Do you think that um, someone who's naturally brilliant, playing by instinct, 
and he cannot read music. Do you think they play any less? Um, uh, is there a, a drop in level, no. or do you think that they really should be quote unquote disc like that because they can't read music? Well, it depends on who they are. Um, the individual themselves, um, like me, I am not a great reader, but I can play. I, I've learned a lot by listening. I've learned a lot by watching. I learned a lot by, um, you know, um, getting advice from other people. Um, not, I would advise all pan people to try and learn to read. For, the reason, own for their own advice. And so they can probably fall in more in the world yes, stage. Yes, because what we're doing now is like, it's still learning by roting where um, you go in the yard and they teach one section, they teach one section. It's all good, but it takes, it's a, it's a time consuming thing. Um, whereas if you have the music written out, and these guys can really can come two or three days mm -hmm. and show them the whole arrangement. If, you, if the arranger has his, his, his thing written out, you come two or three days and show them the piece and they could learn it. Other than that, it will take you two weeks, uh, sometimes more, just to get the whole piece down mm -hmm. where they would be uh, having it, you know, because some arrangers for part again, um, Sometimes they don't have it written out. They have it in their mind, but mm -hmm. some of them have it where like they have this section over there and have this section here. Um, most of the times I try to get it all together um, before I start the work. Um, put it on the tape, uh, do different things. Um, and if I don't like it, I could always change it before I take it to the band because I don't want to take it to the band and then change it. It just depends on how it sits on the pan. Um, but I. Um, I would advise everybody to learn to read because there's a lot of good guys out there, pan players, that are um, going to the different universities now and um, getting degrees in the music with the pan mm -hmm. as a percussion instrument. Um, same person like Andy Nare, all these guys went to college, all this, I mean, they come back for reading. They, they, was a, a different, they were other percussion players and they went to take the pan with them and that's what take them out there. What do you think of the young and upcoming band players, people like Liam Teague? Um, I think Liam Teague is doing well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember Liam Teague is another guy that he plays another instrument, that's his advantage. He plays another instrument like the violin. Right now he's teaches at uh, uh, NIU University in um, Illinois. Which is, you know, this is the advantage that he has. He has. He so you consider Pan being in good hands at the moment? Ah, uh, it's getting better. It's getting, getting better. It's getting better. Beside Liam Teague, there. Between him, people beside him, there's other people. Call and say that it's, um, there's a lot of, I hate to say, it, quote unquote, uh, white guys that are learning to do this thing inside out. I've that seen has. them. I've seen them perform. I've seen them do their arrangements. I've seen them because they're watching what we're doing. And they're going ahead and doing their own thing because they can read and because they can. They approach read. it as a vocation. Mm -hmm. I think that's changing around. You got to watch that because of the fact that being in the universities out there, you see where they come. Some of them, um, of course, it's a vocation thing, but some of them are very serious when they, um, you know, they take it. They go to this college and get their papers and get all the degrees and different things, and then they come back and form their own group and teaches in different colleges all over. I've Do seen you, it before. You said some of the people, I mean, you know them offhand? A um, couple of them, yes. Mm -hmm. Like, um, as we said, Liam Teague, we have Andy, we have uh, Jeff Narell, we have um, a gentleman by the name of Tom Miller. There's a couple of others um, out there okay. that really. Um, Are good at what they do. Yeah, and they just picked it up as a percussion instrument. And, they just, they, they're very bright in the line of uh, the fact that they learned to read and they know the musical thing. You can bring it and put it in front of them and they'll go ahead and learn it. It's a serious thing with them. Yes, it's a serious thing with these people I'm talking about, not just the vocation player or somebody who comes and says, I'll play this here and that's here. Okay, uh, I think I mispronounced. I didn't say vocation, I meant vocation. Like it's, oh, it's their oh, life. Oh, that's so their life. These oh, people okay. are looking at it as a vocation. Oh, yes, They're yes, serious about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry for the mispronunciation. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, yeah. vocation. Okay, that's my main show. Yeah. But they, um, they're really serious about it. Um, the reason why I can say this is because I go to the colleges and see what they do. And all the bands that are in the colleges, I go to the different colleges and play perform every year. Have you heard, okay, you've heard what the bands sound like, those in the colleges. Yes. How do they sound in comparison with your um, Trinidad bands? And they, they sound very good. Um, of course, Trinidad has a feel, there's a feel about But these uh, people are technically correct. Yes. 
technically correct, and they could. Um, they have professors and music that teach. They reproduce them. very well. Yes. Yeah. You see, and then they invite people like us to come to the different colleges and do the workshops and the performances. And when we do that, then they take from there. There's validation. You know, so um, somebody got to go out and spread the word, and we are taking that initiative by doing that also. Don't you think then it? Long overdue that maybe the um, Trinidad and Tobago uh, government and like UWE should have you know taken this up a long time ago. Yes, I think they should have. Um, Are there any rumblings in that area based on your experiences outside? Is there anyone? You uh, know, what the only thing I know now in Trinidad or heard that there's um, is that there's a national Trinidad National Seal Orchestra, which um, I think they take. Uh, uh, members from different bands, the yeah. younger members, and put them together and call it Trinidad National Sivan and it has an area where they like, they're teaching the kids to read, they're teaching them to write, they're teaching them um, all the music and play and do the performances. I was in one of the National Sivans in the earlier days. Um, this way, uh, what they used to do is choose the best player then. Now it's just like who you send, you know. Um, to be in a National Sivan is like being on a um, an all-star cast, uh, like a football team, you had the best um, from all the islands or something like that, you know. Um, you know um, What they did uh, those years, we had the same guy again, Kubo Jack, all of us was in the band. We had the best players in early world was, and um, you had to send the best player, otherwise they are wasting time, you know. Um, but here... Uh, but right until, now, the University of the West Indies the St. Augustine campus, there is yeah. no program like that. There's well, I heard this sat in something. I have not been around, I'm not being really informed much. Um, it would be good if they do. I hope they do something because, mm -hmm. as Everybody I said, else is. it is moving out here. And we're just looking at the States. We ain't even begin to touch Europe yet. It's the same thing there. Europe is, has more bands and more bands in here. Yeah, but um, the, the, the internet is uh, it's quite many of them out there. Yeah. Switzerland has a lot of bands, Sweden has a lot of bands, Paris has a lot of bands, I mean, and, and they're serious. And they sound they're good. all going to the musical festival in Trinidad, most of them uh, who qualify. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, that's a step in the right direction. Let me get personal. Who taught Robert Greenwich right from wrong? Who did? <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. You know, going back to when you were younger. Uh, well, I look Who you look up to as your icon, your, your, not not musical mentor, but just uh, your role model. All my people was in within the music and seriously. Okay. And um, um, I used to look up at uh, you know like I would hear um, like a great guitarist like George Benson or somebody like Stan Getz or somebody that would play music. That's these are the people I really like to listen to what they're playing, to watch. Or so somebody for me to say, well, hey, I. Want to be just like this guy or something? Or, um, it's kind of hard to say because uh, there's so many people out there that I wish I could have been like. Um, there's so many people out there that um, have that touch. It's, um, I look up. I just take my advice from me in a sense and try to take it ahead. If I have to refer back to anybody, then I'll find you do so. Who, who manufactures and tunes your panels? Uh, Bertie Marshall. Okay. He's manufactures a, and tunes? Manufactures and tunes my panels. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, he was one of the first guys in the Savoy Steel Band also. So these are guys, it's like family. Understood. You know, and we all came from Laventil together. And um, he's, the one, um, he's the one that tunes my drums and take care of it, manufacture it, take care of it, and send it out to me. You've had the opportunity to hear um, recordings of panoramas in Trinidad for a number of years, mm -hmm. and you've heard one uh, from New York's panorama. Um, well, not actually, what you've just heard is a bit of the DVD. Mm -hmm. You've heard the recording quality right. on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe you actually have a copy of Moods this year. Yes, the I do. Band. I do, and that was and, great to and, at least have that. What are your um, thoughts, if any, as to the recordings um, that you've heard mm -hmm. in Trinidad and the one that you have of personally from your 2002 production of Moods and what you've just seen on the DVD uh, from the Basement Studios? I think Basement Studios is doing well with, with what they're 
um, they approached it, they really recorded it. Like, um, as a matter of fact, um, like there is a 94 or something, we did a new work for Carnival, mm -hmm. and I find that was such a great recording. 95, what was that, seven years ago? Yeah, that's how long this one's been happening. And I find that um, this recording was great. Uh, I know you probably have more advanced equipment now and more advanced stuff. But at the time, whatever you had probably was advanced too. <laughs> you know, so anyway, the, um, the, the, the quality of recording is great here from what I gathered, from what I, I have seen and heard. Um, they have a couple of guys in LA, um, Sanji Electronics and um, also someone else is trying to record. But um, I still think he has a little bit to go before he could really get um, the kind of song that um, would interest me to say, well, yes, um, that is it, you know. I used him this year, intro that I had to record him. It was okay, but I didn't like um, some things I don't like. Um, I did not like, I should say, it's because um, we were rushing, we were into this. Um, he just put five mics in front of the band and we recorded and that. It's not, I don't think it's, I don't think he get full, full, you know, load of the stuff from there because he just pick up the front line and, or the pans or the first two rows or something because after that the rhythm section is all the way in the back. You know, you're hearing them, but it's not as fine as you should as a, as a live recording. Um, you had an opportunity to observe some of the techniques there. Sure, I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when we recorded modes, um, I was not. I when I when we recorded modes, I should have really realized that I'm recording and set the band up in a different way um, by putting all the tenors in one section, these guitars in one section, yes, and then you get that full sound around there. Because I noticed, well, you know, when I noticed um, the setup, I didn't say anything much because I watched like you. We had two quadraphonics, and they put one mic between one quadraphonic. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's a little too close there. Um, uh, when they pick up the bass mics, uh, there was a combo player right there. You hear a lot of him, I mean, I'm just, you know, kind of observing the CD, um, um, the, you know, the recording. And they just slipped me not to put the band in a, um, a recording format, a recording that, format that I would have really enjoyed because then you like get the full body of the band. You know, um, because you know, everybody would be on their own separate little things and you know, they get the full body at the bar. But by and all, they, it was very good. And I played the CD for a lot of people and they like what they're hearing mm -hmm. and they say, well, hey, were you guys recorded? So we recorded right in the pan yard. And they say, man, that's real nice. And I guess we was kind of little indoors too, so it's a little more, you got kind of more around the sound type thing. Um, but all in all, it's, I think um, you guys are doing a wonderful job with it. Recording of the bands, and um, it's the only um, company I see in New York <laughs> is doing something for the pan. And I hope that you guys continue doing what you're doing, and um, just get the pan men to come in and mm -hmm. understand what you're doing. And, you know, maybe I don't know how you, how to take their hand and bring them in and say, mm -hmm. well, "This is what we're doing, man. And this is for the pan." And this is it. Yeah, this is for the pan. Let's do this. And you see, too many other people around here doing it. So you know, make use of this and put it out there. And it's a company like you guys. Are, I would support any time. You got a glimpse, not very much, but a few minutes of the DVD. Yes. Mm. Uh, it's great. Um, I would like to probably check it out some other time again and see. And, but the little glimpse I got, I mean, it's, it's very nice and clean. Um, There's actually no recording um, on a pan on DVD to the best of uh, my, my personal knowledge. Uh, uh, no, no, I mean, there's a lot of VHS tapes. Have, have, so. have you seen any pan DVDs out? No. I really haven't seen any as yet, and um, you guys doing that, I think you're doing a wonderful job. And, um, uh, I think, you don't stop, in other words, continue doing what you're doing, and you know, um, there's a lot of, uh, it's next year to come again, the Panorama. You would yeah. like to be recorded again? Depend of course, sure. Whichever band you happen sure. to be arranging for? I would love to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's always good to have that... Uh, that history back there. Yeah, you know, so a lot of the pans, a lot of steel bands, yeah. A lot of groups are a lot of the music is being lost after Panorama. Hmm. And they need something like but it's this. Being recorded. Huh? It's being recorded. It's being recorded, yeah. But some <laughs> bands are not you know, some have not recorded and you know, they're gone. I mean, you know, they did the piece, they worked so hard that week or two before Panorama, you know, leaving their regular job, whatever they're doing or whatever, staying up late at night, whatever. 
after the panorama, that's the end of you, mm. you know. So they need something like this to keep them rolling and um, say, well, look, this is what we have, this is what we're doing, you know, come together, um, you know, find some whatever form of sponsorship to get this thing rolling, uh, put out the CD out there, put out the DVD out there and get it rolling, you know. Um, I think, um, as I say, you're the only guys I see doing this so far around here in New York area. Um, in too many other areas anyway. Well, I mean, um, you know, they have them out in Washington and all these different places and mm -hmm. California, but what the limit I see here, I'm very, very much interested. It's very interesting to see that it's happening. Well, we need to plan people to come together and um, this would be good. Mm -hmm. So we can document. Are you guys going to do any CDs this year? Are you going to make a CD of the bands and kind of put it out there? I know that there is supposed to be um, a pan CD of the um, 2002 Panorama selections of some of the bands who were recorded prior to Panorama, but it oh. would be their Panorama selections. Right. So uh, that's that's in the works. So yeah, that that, that, that would be important because I mean you don't want it to lose and you know just slip mm -hmm. away like earlier years. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody come back and ask what is band player um, 19 uh, <laughs> so and so. But I, it was copy. good, you know, but you have a copy? No, I have a little tape I make from a little cassette. Come on, you know? So they needed to be heard out there, and the market is so huge out there, they, 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 they want it. They need it. They need it very, very much, and they need, people you know, need to hear what's going on here. Because, you know, um, mm -hmm. not just in this country, but other countries, like Japan and all these other places. And yeah, this is where it's really happening. Yeah, I just have a CD, I just got a CD not too long ago. I did, um, we did for Carnival in Trinidad. Um, the Japanese did it, mm -hmm. and they did like three or four different bands, like they did um, Desperados, they did Exodus, and they did Phase 2, and they did some solo guys like myself, uh, Boomsi, and uh, Professor, and other books. And they have a CD out right now. How is it? Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. Um, but they bought their own equipment, like how you guys walk around with mm -hmm. stuff. They bought their own equipment, they went around to the yards, they tell them exactly what's going on, set the things in motion, and the CD is out now. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a... Uh, a good team with them, from lawyers back, attorneys back. So the business is, is good. Yeah. And um, it was very good. I enjoyed doing it. And um, they take care of you very well also. And the business is all right. So I was very happy with that. Mr. Robert Greenwich. Yes, my dear. Very, very good having you in Wednesday with Talks. Yeah. It was a pleasure speaking with you getting insight into you as the person, your experiences professionally, uh, your mentors, mm -hmm. um, and also your viewpoints and your hopes and aspirations. Wish you all the best professionally. Thank you. And may you continue, you know, lifting Pan yeah. and also being a, a light to the um, Pan world out there. Taking yeah. It, I'm you know, just trying follow to, in your footsteps. Just trying to use it, use it. Take the vehicle out there. Yeah, it was really good travel. having you in When Steel Talks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. When Steel Talks, everybody listens. listens.